Okay. Um, we'll get started uh, here this morning. Um, what I have up on the screen here is a uh, PowerPoint presentation that I converted over to a PDF. It's on the Learn at, UD, Learn at UW site right now, so if you wanted to follow along, you could certainly go ahead and do that. And what I'm going to do here is just uh, hit Control L and make it a little bit larger. So I've got it actually right now in uh, Adobe Reader. And the reason you may want to follow along on this is because we do have some links, hot links that we'll look at today. And you can therefore just click on those and get to the same sites that I'll be looking at. <sighs> I'm not sure. I'm trying to do some lecture capture here. And for some reason, my audio is jumping in and out. OK, first of all, we're going to look at just some general areas of information retrieval. Then we're going to take a quick look at some search tips, electronic search tips, some things that you may not be familiar with, and specifically uh, some search tips that are unique to Google, some advanced search tips that can really help you zero in on particular types of publications you're looking at. So when we're looking here, first of all, are different uh, types of publications. And understand here, by the way, that these slides are full of text. And it's just for your information. It's one way to just. Uh, catalog all this information so that you have access to it. Um, I, there are a couple of slides in here that we'll get to where there's just a few short words on them. And as you'll see, it's not of much use to you when you go back and look at them. So that's one of the reasons that they tend to be wordy. So quite different from, I want to point out, a presentation that you would put together that you're going to deliver to an audience. And that's the last time they're going to actually see that particular presentation. They're not going to go back and review it. Um, you don't need to put all kinds of verbiage in there to help them understand it when they um, review it. So first of all, uh, um, why do we uh, need to get this information and what does it all include? Um, up front, I tell you, and I've mentioned this pro the first day of class, is that students typically do a pretty poor job of digging out information prior to starting a work on a design project. And quite frequently, there are a lot of good ideas out there. There may be solutions that uh, you develop that have already been developed. And, and that's not uncommon. Uh, I point out that if I gave two engineers the same uh, assignment, the same design project, uh, I would not be surprised if they came up with uh, near identical solutions. That happens very frequently. The bottom line is that, and you've heard this verbiage before, Necessity is the mother of invention. And until you really need something, you don't try to create something. And when I force you to create something, like I mentioned, you may come up, two different people would come up with a similar design. In that respect, a lot of this stuff may already be out there. That's not to say you shouldn't work on a project if there's a fairly good solution out there. Um, you can always improve on designs, and that's something that you'll spend most of your time as a design engineer doing, is refining designs created by others. A lot of products that you're working on, if you're working on product design, um, well, a lot of the products are ones that your company maybe has been producing for several years. So you're wondering, well, why am I put on this project as an engineer? You're constantly working to improve those uh, particular products for one reason or another. <coughs> changes in materials, changes in vendors. Sometimes you lose a vendor that was, uh, maybe they go bankrupt, go out of business, get sold, whatever, and you've got to find an alternative source. And that forces you to make other changes to your product to incorporate that uh, new uh, original equipment manufacturer's product. You know, if you've got to switch engines, you can understand that. There's a lot of things that go into putting an engine into a vehicle, and you can understand all the changes that would surround that change. So keep in mind, 
Um, overall here, there's information out there. It may be similar to what you're working on. There may be good solutions out there. Those are the things you're trying to find and uncover. We're looking at, in some cases, designs that are featured by our competitors. I would tell you that when I worked in industry, when I first got out of school, I worked out as a design engineer doing skid steer loader design. And when a competitor would come out with a machine, we'd be the first uh, people to have that machine. We'd have dealers that maybe carried, in addition to our line, that competitor's line. And certainly that dealer would be able to uh, get access, early access to one of those new machines that the competitor had produced. And what we would do is rent it, lease it. In some cases, we didn't have to pay for it. And we'd bring it into our shop, and we'd literally rip it apart and look at all the design features. we look at who is supplying uh, different products to our competitor, what maybe modifications they made to those particular products to incorporate them into their piece of equipment. So understand that as well as when you're out there as a manufacturer, a designer, that your competition is watching you and watching you quite closely. It's one of the reasons that as engineers you attend uh, you know, farm technology days. You'd say well, that's only for users, end users. I'll tell you that there are probably more um, people that are not associated directly with on-farm production, meaning that they're not active farmers, attending farm tech days than there are actual farmers. When I worked for Gale Company, uh, we'd take a day off. The whole engineering department would take a day off to go to farm tech days. So that's a whole slew. We'd have 50 people there. Other companies do the same thing. You can see how numbers stack up in a hurry. But that is where we went to get additional information on our competitors' products. One of the other things you can look at doing, obviously, is talking to people that have worked on this prod problem. We're going to talk about market research in two lectures. You're going to be asked to interview an individual that's not associated with the university or is not a relative. And you can ask them all sorts of questions. And you'll say to yourself, well, where do I find those people? Well, today we'll see names of all kinds of people when we start digging into different types of publications. Those are the kind of people we want to talk to. You've got a list of people that are associated with patents, right? Right on the patent. They're the assignees. There's nothing wrong with contacting those individuals. Can you think of somebody that knows more about the, the area that you're working on than people that have designed similar products, and you know their name, you know who they work for, and they may be willing to talk to you. They may just be sole proprietors, people that came up with a design uh, in their garage. And they'd be, you know, those are the kind of people that probably want to talk to you all day because nobody else ever calls them up about their design. So there's all kinds of people out there that have great uh, feedback for you, if nothing else. So dig them out. When we look at our technical literature and technical publications, we're going to break them into different categories. And the principal reason for doing that is they have different levels of credibility, say more than anything. And the first major category that we talk about all these is technical and research reports. And these are publications that are typically produced by individuals that are working at uh, universities such as this. They may be also working for a governmental agency, federal, state, or even local government. Those publications are typically reviewed by peers prior to publication. In some cases, it's mandatory. In some cases, it's a very strenuous and uh, tough, actually, review process to go through if you're an author. And those are worth a lot more. Those are worth a lot more than other bits of information that you may find on uh, the web. Second category are laws and codes and standards. We'll talk a little bit about laws and codes today and standards we'll talk about at our next lecture. But 
these are typically documents that will control, restrict what we may want to do. If you're working on, say, wetland restoration, you're going to go to the NRCS website, and we'll do that today. We'll visit that governmental website. And you're going to dig out, uh, you know, practices that are commonly used by NRCS. They may have design procedures. They have procedures for calculating soil loss that they want you to follow. They have standard design procedures. There are a lot of other standards out there in all kinds of other areas. And standards, as we'll see, aren't necessarily mandatory. You don't have to follow them by according to the law, unless, of course, the law tells you that you have to follow that particular standard. But that's typically not the case. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't or uh, you shouldn't follow the standard. In some cases, if it's a safety standard, it may not be mandatory uh, according to the law to follow it. But believe you me, you don't have a choice. Because if you, there's a standard out there with respect to safety and you don't follow it and somebody gets injured, they're going to take you to the cleaners. Intellectual property uh, was covered last time, and we'll get that captured lecture online for you. Handbooks and manuals. If you've got a really broad project, and I would pick the malting project for one, that has a lot of different steps and there's maybe a lot of different ways that's been done and you want an overview of that particular process, I'm typically going to look for some kind of a textbook. There's a lot of food engineering textbooks, <coughs> excuse me, sitting in the library. There may be a whole section in that food engineering textbook on malting. What a great place to start. You're also going to find a list of references at the end of that particular chapter on malting. That's a good place to start your literature review. Go to those publications and see what they reference. And things tree out, you find out who the big names are in malting, in malting research. And those are things that you can focus on. Just point out, if you can find uh, a name that's common uh, with respect to a particular process, track down their website. If they're a university researcher, they may have a whole host of other publications related to their research on that site. As we move down the line on terms of credibility, uh, we have product advertising and literature. Typically something that doesn't have a lot of science um, knowledge, I guess, or based information to, to add uh, to you know, what we're collecting for information, but um, it does give you ideas of how things are done. In a lot of cases, if you're designing a product and you have to put together a, a set of specifications, which you'll have to do uh, if you're doing products in this class, you're typically questioning, well, you know, how much should I charge? How big should this be? How much should this weigh? There's all kinds of physical parameters. And quite honestly, you want to develop something, design something that uh, surpasses what your competitors producing in those different categories. So the way to do that is you have to know what your competitors have for specifications. And I can tell you again from working where I worked at Gale Company that before we started our design we had a whole list of specifications that we were supposed to hit. They're targets that we need to establish before we start design. And could we hit them all? Well, quite honestly, it was next to impossible because when you have a list of, say, 20 or 30 specifications and they're established by looking at all these other uh, machines out there and you're trying to better every one of those machines in every one of those categories, you're not going to be able to do it. Not unless you've been working at this for umpteen years. So you have to pick and choose. And that's when, you know, decision making becomes a big part of engineering design. And that's something that uh, we're going to work on as well, which we call selection methodology decision making. Popular press articles, as you can see here, again, non-refereed articles, typically just like product advertisements and literature. Most newspaper articles, a uh, lot of stuff today that uh, you pull off of the web. Lots of information there typically not something that's worth a lot. And we'll show some ways to restrict 
your literature searches uh, to sites that avoid a lot of that information. So let's look at some electronic search tips. This is just a quick list, and uh, I've got some uh, another slide here for stuff that's specific to Google. But there's a lot of just basic things here a lot of individuals don't realize. First of all, when you type in a bunch of words, typically every word matters. Now, there are some words that are ignored. We don't really know what those are. Uh, those are actually, in some cases, uh, well-kept secrets of uh, the search engine. And it can make searching a lot more efficient and just as broad if they ignore uh, some of those words called stop words. But you're not going to have to worry about that. Most cases, though, you put a list of words out there, it's looking at, to find a web page okay, that has every one of those words. So if you type out a sentence, it's looking to, for a web page that has every one of those words. I don't care if it's, you know, you could say prepositions, and, and so forth. Those may be some stop words. Well, I better not use the word and, or, or not. Those are very specific search uh, words. But there's other words, adjectives, that you'll stick in there. And by sticking them in there, actually, you're not going to find all the web pages you want because it can't can't find that word on the page. So you want to really keep things fairly simple, very specific words, which is the third item up here, rather than, you know, uh, you know, a lot of different types of adjectives. Now, you can do different searches using, we'll, we'll see that in a second, where we can put all those adjectives in there, and it's not going to search for every one. It just needs to find one of those. And that's what uh, we do when we use or, OK? When you have a list of words that are synonymous, you can put them all in there, but you have to use or between them. Otherwise, it's going to try to find a site that has all those words on that page. So that's something important that a lot of people don't realize. Searches are almost in all cases case insensitive. So you don't have to capitalize any words um, that would be say, proper nouns. You want to put a phrase in double quotes if you're looking for web pages that have that specific phrase. We're going to demonstrate some of these real quick here. An asterisk is typically used as a wild card. Now, I got to back up here and say that these um, tips are pretty standard, the ones here, but may not be applicable to all search engines, but these are the ones that are fairly standard. And you can eliminate most common words, um, and it won't have an impact typically on search, and I've talked about some of the prepositions. These are stop words, so I can't tell you what ones you should all eliminate, and they vary by uh, search engine. But understand that if you're looking for a very specific title, uh, you're going to put that title in quotes, and you also want to make sure that you definitely include then uh, these very common words. If the is in the title, it needs to be within those quotes. So I think we'll just jump to the next slide here, and then we'll back up and just do some searching. And if you've got your laptops up, you can play around with some of this stuff. These are uh, some advanced Google search techniques that well, there may be a couple of search engines that uh, have some things that are very similar in common, but by far and away, Google's the most powerful search engine out there. Uh, we'll look at a couple others uh, that have been developed and have went through a number of changes and have been merged. Uh, you may be familiar with Bing today, which is a conglomeration of some other things. I think Yahoo now uses Bing, and uh, some things that Microsoft developed were merged with some other search engines to form Bing. And I will tell you, Bing is not uh, really near as powerful as Google. So um, you know, you're still going to start most of your searches using uh, Google. Something that's pretty powerful that Google has is the use of uh, the minus sign. If you put a minus sign before a word, it will ignore any web p 
pages that have that word on them. Now, we can also, um, and also ignore websites that have that word in the title, in the URL as well. And the importance of that is what I just mentioned. If you want to uh, really stay away from sites that have a lot of advertising on them, understand those are almost all .com sites. So what you do when you do your search, again, we'll demonstrate this stuff, is type in your keyword that you want, and then you would put minus, and then you can put .com. Or you could just put com. Probably it'll eliminate uh, it in either case. There cannot be a space, by the way, between that minus sign and the word that follows it. So that's pretty powerful. And you can do that multiple times. You can do, you know, minus this term, minus this term, minus this term. For example, where would you use something like that would be um, an example I saw online that was pretty good was uh, Jaguar. Now, you can have, you know, cars with that name. You got football teams with that name. But maybe you're after the animal. So, you know, you can type in Jaguar. But then maybe it's minus car, minus automobile, minus football. You know, put anything that you think would pick up, you know, Jaguar in some other format. And that really starts restricting your uh, web pages to what you want. So that's a pretty powerful tool that a lot of people aren't familiar with. Um, there are some other ways to restrict um, the amount of information you get back. And that is, is you want to specify exactly where a particular uh, term is found. And by that, I mean, is it um, in the title of what they call the web page? Is it in the URL of the web page? Maybe you want it in the URL. Maybe you do not want it in the URL. And what we do here is if you want it in the URL, you can use what we see down the second from the bottom there is uh, in URL, and then there's a semicolon. And immediately after that semicolon, no space, you put your word. And that'll make sure that it'll look for sites that have that word in the URL. Now, if there's a bunch of words that you want in there, you can certainly um, uh, do, you know, in URL, colon, that word, and then another in URL, colon, and that word. That works. Or alternatively, you can start that search query with all in URL, semicolon, and then a list of words that you, and it'll make sure that all of those are in the URL. File type. I'll demonstrate these. You got a very specific file type, you know it was a PDF that somebody published. You know their name. Uh, maybe you even know what it's about. Well, that's three bits of information that you can use. We can restrict all our searches to certain file types, PDFs, PPTs, docs, whatever it might be. And certainly, we can use those other search options that we have to zero in on the author, the <coughs> title, whatever it might be. Uh, site is the same thing. If you want to go to a specific site, you just uh, and you want to restrict it to a specific site. And I'll demonstrate this. I think with uh, we'll use our BSE website. We think there's something on the BSE website. I know it's on the BSE website, and it's about this. So you just type in that word and then site colon and then that um, site, the URL for that particular site. Why don't we just? Uh, the best way to do this is obviously is to pop out of here and, and just demonstrate it. And you have obviously, hopefully, uh, a laptop in front of you. You can do your own thing with it. Um, this is one I just uh, played around with uh, prior to class. To showcase something, uh, let's just start talking about putting something in quotes. When you put something in quotes, I'm going to do what I did here first. I'm going to just put biological engineering. It's going to look for websites that have biological engineering on the website. In, it's important to understand it, it has to be in that order. That has to be the exact phrase, the exact verbiage. So if I do that search, I come up with 2,340,000 results. 
You don't, you're not going to find biological systems engineering on any of those pages, okay, unless it's a website that in addition to having biological systems engineering, that exact phrase, it also has biological engineering on that same page. And that's actually probably, you know, not uncommon. We can actually check, we can check that out. I'll show you how in just a second. But understand what happens if I type, put systems in the middle, <coughs> biological systems engineering. Just going to go for those exact pages that have that in. And actually, it came right up and put uh, our website at the very top. Now, there's other things that Google does that brings that to the top, okay? Now, here's where I mentioned if you want to find a page that has both of them on, you'd have to put, this is where we use and. We want to find a site that has both biological systems engineering and biological engineering on the exact same page. This is the way you would do that. Both phrases has to be put in like this. Understand what it's looking for. And that's not bad, 9,660. Okay, let's um, just a couple examples. So you saw I used uh, the double quotes there. Again, one thing to say is a lot of people like to do this. They've got a question about something and they type the question in. They type a really long sentence in. That's not something you want to do. Okay, be very specific. There's just keywords and understand that that's what the search engine is doing. It's not trying to, it's not doing a search on that sentence. It's never going to find probably that sentence. Okay, and if you put that sentence in quotes, okay, obviously you'd have to have that exact verbiage in that order in that, uh, on that page and chances are probably pretty remote. What it's doing is you're just putting, it's looking at every word as a, a whole series of keywords, and it's trying to find a page that has all those uh, keywords on it. Now, the only way to get away from that is to understand uh, the special use of or, and, and also not. You can use the word not where it will make sure that that keyword is not on that particular site. It works a lot like the minus does in the Google search. So I just used and, and we could come in here and instead of this put not, see, that's going to limit us down from 9,600 down to something less. I would assume, well, it says, okay, well, no, it gave us more. There's obviously more pages that just have biological systems engineering than have biological systems engineering and also biological engineering. Actually, that's what I would have expected, as I mentioned a little bit earlier. And definitely, if you go up to OR, you're going to get a whole host of them. It's going to double and increase what we had before. I'm thinking, well, hold on here. OR, biological engineering. This would have to have both, uh, one or the other. I don't know about that. It treats those, should treat those the same way. Or, I'm not sure what's going on there. That doesn't seem correct to me. Okay, well, let's leave that and try, I want to try uh, and demonstrate some of the other, uh, as long as we're in Google, some of those other items. I um, started with last night doing, um, for example, I was doing, I did sugar beets. And when you type it in like this, understand that it's looking for pages that have both sugar and beets, both those two words showing up on that website. And that's certainly not typically what you want. And that's important to understand if you're doing sugar beets, you won't just type in sugar beets if you're talking about a particular vegetable. 
This is one of those situations where you want to make sure you put it in quotes. Okay? I think if you just did sugar, you probably, let's just separate those out. I don't, let's see what we get for hits if we just do both of them as separate keywords. So you get, it jumps you up to 3,150,000. What I did is, if you're interested in um, some good publications, most of the stuff that's free out there, point out, it's typically in a PDF format that you can download. So if I'm looking for, that, that's another hint. If you're looking for a, a technical publication that you might be able to download, you can use the uh, file type and just put uh, PDF. So Sugar Beats uh, is going to be on that page, and then you'll get uh, some PDFs. Interesting, we've you'll see here probably looking at some research publications you start getting a lot of websites that are related to universities maybe I want to zero in and I like I mentioned before it's a paper that uh, I know the author of you probably want to do a uh, you can put it in if it's the name of a person I'm gonna see if this works I'll go with Irwin uh, Goodman, and the reason I'm picking on Irwin, Irwin was uh, acting dean before Bill Tracy, before our current dean in Cal's, and Irwin does a lot of sh sugar beet research. He's also chair over here in um, Hort. So let's see what we get with that. I don't know what that came up with, quite honestly. I think I spelled his name correctly. Oh, man. Oh. Let me just, I'm going to get rid of the quotes and go back just with Goodman and see what I get. This respect, I may have something. His name is maybe spelled different because it's looking like it's not coming up with really anything. That usually means I have an error, searching error. Uh, well, I got, I've definitely got Goodman's, and you can see his uh, title here, but I'd not, I'm not seeing ones that would be associated with Erwin Goodman here. But nevertheless, you can see they're all PDFs. They all deal with sugar beets, and they have Goodman in the title. Okay, so ways to kind of uh, zero in on your web searches. There's a little bit more of an explanation uh, on your on a PDF document that's on your Learn at UW site under the lecture notes section. So you have a section on Learn at UW site that covers. PowerPoint presentations, lecture notes, and pretty soon we'll have one on there that'll have links to uh, captured uh, lectures. So, let's move back to this presentation. The special databases, just talk a little bit about those. And I, say, I shouldn't say databases. These are really search engines that are used to look at databases. And specifically, when we talk about Google Scholar, and Nancy had mentioned that on Tuesday. And we can, we can go there as well here. We'll just click on and go to Google Scholar, because they'll have a, right on Google Scholar, you'll see you've got an option to search for patents at Google Scholar. But that's, they're going to look at a specific set of databases. There are a number of different databases out there, and different search engines will look at different combinations of databases. And the next slide is kind of going to tell you, or one of the following slides, is that you should probably, if you're going to start these searches and you're on campus, you're part of a university, go to the UW System Library, in our particular case, and do these searches. 
They've got links. Nancy showed some of those links last time. The reason for going there is a lot of times when, like Google Scholar, comes up with a document, it's not a document that you could freely download. Unless, of course, um, you're subscribed to that particular database. Well, the UW system is subscribed to a number of these databases, which enables you to download a lot of documents that people outside of the university cannot download. They'd have to, at least not without a, a specific charge. So Google Scholar is one of those that you probably want to maybe open up inside the UW system. Uh, Bing is the one I mentioned to you, some, you know, formerly called Live Search, Windows Live Search, MSN Search. And again, it was joined with uh, uh, Yahoo's search engine, and it's brought together into Bing. And I still don't think it's very powerful. The Web of Knowledge was probably mentioned, I think, by Nancy last time as well. You're going to see that when you do some searches in the UW system, it brings you to the Web of Knowledge website. The Web of Knowledge, formerly like also uh, the Web of Science, again is a search engine that looks at very specific databases, and in, in this case, ones that are related to science. A one that is pretty good and uh, that you can look at and typically sometimes get some free uh, downloads is this uh, Cyrus, I guess, and there's Cyrus. Uh, and we'll look at, we can look at that one too here in a, uh, a second. Let's just um, pop on Google Scholar. Again, the good thing about, hopefully this is going to, oh, I don't know if I got to pop out of here. Let's do one. Allow. I did some searches from using um, this PDF version from my desktop, and it went pretty fast. But I don't know if this is having problems because it's uh, got to go through the Wi-Fi system or not. Seems like it's shutting down on me here. Well. Yeah, okay, whatever. What the hell kind of crap is coming up here? Okay, it brought it up in Internet Explorer for some reason. That's fine. Here's, again, Google Scholar. And as um, you saw this website last time, there's the check if you want to include patents in your particular search. Uh, you know, pick any particular topic. And I will, uh, you know, pick on, I don't know, alfalfa, silage. Don't ask, ask me where I came up with that one, but there you go. Uh, lots of technical publications. If you're within our UW system, uh, if you click on it, it'll probably take you to a site. It'll take you to one of those databases where you can download that particular PDF. That's the beauty of working within the system. And let's just quickly pop on another one down here. I thought that this works pretty well as a uh, search engine. And they have, uh, they've got just a lot of information, some of it that uh, they've scanned. It's not copyrighted. Uh, you can use it, download it. There might be a lot of, there's actually a lot of government documents that can't be copyrighted and are always available to the public. But you can see here they're talking about 545 million scientific items indexed at last count. So we don't need to go through that, but use it in a very similar manner 
that you would use Google Scholar, but understand that some of the search tips that uh, apply to Google don't apply on this particular site. Do use multiple search engines, databases, when you got the options. So I've given you four of them that you probably want to utilize. And the uh, point here is to start within our, our UW system. And this is just, uh, let's click on here once. Okay, that's great. I'll let that one go. That link should be pretty good because I just copied that off last night. But that was the link uh, to databases. We'll get there. We can get there real quickly. Let's just go um, there and I'll use Firefox. Go to libraries and click when you click on databases, I would tell you to go to by subject. And you're going to see them listed by subject, but also I think uh, that sometimes more importantly by type at the base. And you can see the different uh, categories, government documents, standards. This is the link that you used last time, patents and trademarks. So get used to, uh, again, going to this site only because, like I mentioned, once you click on the publication that you find on this particular site, you're typically going to be able to download it for no cost. A lot of this information, uh, again, you can go back to this PowerPoint, pull it off. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on some of these slides. This particular note just refers to some of the research guides that you have access to at the university, and I see that I don't have those hot-linked, um, so I'm not going to be able to click on them right here. Again, follow, uh, follow those, that link, and it'll take you to a site that's just been developed for biological systems engineering. All it does is has databases that would be commonly used by researchers in our particular area. And a lot of those databases are going to be common to other areas in egg or to other engineering fields. Okay, this just talks a little bit briefly about technical research reports. Understand that they are really the place that you want to go to get most of your design information. That's the most credible uh, information out there. A lot of this stuff traditionally wasn't obviously online, and that is totally flipped from the standpoint that a lot of these documents are no longer published in hard copy. So that's a transition that has occurred within the last decade. I would tell you that online searching probably started with most of our major organizations 15 years ago. They started putting techni technical libraries online and we're publishing hard copies with little use of the technical libraries, principally because they didn't have a lot of information on them at the time. And in this last uh, 15 years, they've uh, built up their online libraries by doing a lot of scanning of previous publications. So that's the nice thing about it, things we couldn't get uh, 10 years ago uh, that maybe didn't even exist in our own libraries. They went back even before that time. Uh, organizations have went back and, and dug into their archives, pulled out all this information and put it online and now it's, uh, you know, available to everybody, not just the people that had access to that hard copy in that one library in the country. So that's pretty cool. Again, technical research reports. These are just those links to uh, the library and you can go back to our library page. Um, I just picked out ASABE here because most of you would probably be student members of ASAB. They have a technical library that, again, has a little uh, search engine. You can select, type in some words and select what you want it to look for. They can, you can click on all of these, obviously, if you want keywords in the title, uh, author, document number, 
words. And well, I guess it doesn't want you to do that. Words anywhere would be include all four of these. So let's just do, um, you know, I let's say I worked on an engineer. I work on an engineering practice EP, and I don't know if it puts it in. I'll do a lot of them. <laughs> That's pretty interesting. So. Here's a technical search. I was just typing in a number for a engineering practice or a standard. And this is the specific, uh, I don't see the one that I wanted coming up here, which is kind of strange. Only I know it's referenced in this document, EPD near 559. So I'd go back and probably type that in a little bit differently, knowing that I didn't get what I wanted. But again, ASAB's website. Government uh, documents, the big thing to realize is they can't be copyrighted. Uh, federal, state, whatever level, you're uh, one of the people that obviously supports these sites via your tax dollar. You typically, uh, you can copy, understand if it's not copyrighted, that literally means that you can take that information right out of that document and put it into your document. You can legally do that. There's nothing wrong with that. You should always reference it. But you're not required to do so. You cannot get into trouble doing something like that. So make that clear. You can't plagiarize using government documents. Now, for classes, obviously, if they tell you you can't copy somebody else's material, including the government, then, of course, you can't do that for that class. But it's still legal for you to, to take government information and stick it into your documents. Some of our extension agents get pretty upset about that, by the way, um, only because there's companies that, and, and even individuals, that publish books, different manuscripts, different aids, and they take information that our extension agents have developed and literally put it right into their document without even acknowledging it. And that's pretty frustrating, obviously, if you, you write this and, and they're selling it basically as their own information. The government was probably the first organization to provide us with uh, um, online documents in volume. And only because it was so darn costly for the federal government to not do that. The federal government basically, um, well, they had a big publishing arm that, well, send documents out basically on request. And typically, pretty much at a cost that was less than what it cost them to publish those documents. And some of those documents would be pretty thick. You start looking at some of the regulations that we'll look at here in a second, immense documents. And they s sent out hundreds of thousands of some of these particular documents. And I can uh, pick on some of the OSHA uh, regulations specifically. If you're working in any kind of an environment uh, where you've got uh, people employed, there's certainly a lot of requirements uh, surrounding that work environment. And those documents are things that you need to have in hand at your company. So where are you getting those? You're going to the federal government for those. Anything that's tax related, right? All those tax publications. You had hard copies and they maintain typically piles of those hard copies at every library in the United States. You can imagine how much paperwork is involved in that. So basically, they put all this stuff online about as, uh, as quick as the systems were up and running. So, well, you can go to, uh, we'll, we'll take a visit to the main government website, which will get you access to a lot of these federal agencies. I just got a list here. I'll just, I'm just going to pop in at, on one to save time. There's, they're just great resources of information. And let's go to the NRCS website, Natural Resources Conservation Services. And the reason being that they have a lot of standard procedures that you need to follow when you're working in this particular area. Typical website, you typically got to think around a little bit to find stuff. Uh, 
field office and technical guides. Uh, let's pick that. Here's a link to engineering. Don't know, ask me where I'm going to end up because I know what it's like when I get on these sites. You, typically, you'll, you'll end up at a place where you can download quite a bit of information. Oh, t -t 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 -t, this looks like to be, to be the exact same link. It's going to bring up the same page. Technic oh, here's technical resources, engineering. I'm going to go to this site. This is actually located, I believe, down in Texas because I've worked with this particular group. Download conservation tools. Okay, let's see what this is all about. Okay, well. Okay, here's an example. This is the kind of stuff you, if you, that you'll hopefully stumble upon. It looks like they have just a tremendous amount of different software and systems available for doing a lot of their work. You can just see a whole list of stuff that can be downloaded here. ND drain. ND drain determines lateral effect of drains in close proximity, uh, proximity to wetland. So um, it looks like that would be ideal for people that have wetlands um, for their design projects. So here's a site. This is just, you know, just the tip of the iceberg for you. So one of the sites, just to point out that people in the natural resources area would always want to go to. Okay? If you're working on something energy related, certainly the Department of Energy and so forth. The big thing is, is once you obtain one of those publications, look at all the references that it has. Look at its keywords as well. Keywords from certain publications help you expand your search. Another big area is laws and codes. Uh, understand that we're talking about something that dictates what we do when we talk about laws, and same thing with codes. Exactly what level of regulation you need to deal with varies depending upon your type of project. We talked about NRCS. NRCS is a federal organization, and they have offices throughout the state of Wisconsin. They have districts within the state of Wisconsin. And with the, if you're within that district, uh, that particular federal district, you want to work with that particular office. Now, they're pretty consistent in how they do things, from do things from region to region. You also would need to abide by requirements of the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Okay, and they have individuals that are associated with regions throughout the United, uh, throughout the state of Wisconsin. If you're working at a county level, every county has typically a land and water conservation department, or it may just be a land conservation or a water conservation department. So if you're in that county, you need to be working with those individuals. People that are working on projects uh, with our natural resources group, I'd point out, typically we start working with if it's a wetland restoration project, that stuff's done at the federal level. So you're going to be working on a federal project and work, working with federal personnel. If you're working on another project locally, you're probably working with Dayton County Land and Water Conservation Department. So you'll get to know different groups of individuals. If I'm working with buildings, our buildings are controlled at the state level. We have state building codes. We have a commercial building code and a residential building code, and I need to abide by those particular guidelines. There's nothing at the federal level that I need to um, live by unless I'm building something on federal land. That would be like an Indian reservation, or if I'm building something for the federal government, then I'd have to abide by something that the federal government has. At the federal level, we have the Code of Federal Regulations, the CFR. Uh, we can go to that website. I may just bypass that for the sake of time. These are titles in the Code of Federal Regulation. When I talk about federal regulation, we're talking about some, you know, an immense set of documents that really regulate everything we do at the federal level. You name it, it's in these documents. This is, this is the main 
uh, set of laws that you want to look at. And you can see the various areas that we have. And the one that, when I talked about OSHA, for example, they come under uh, Title 29, labor. So OSHA is just a small section in that whole set of federal regulations. Well, let's go, uh, I might as well just quickly, uh, let's go, I'm going to go to just, uh, let me back up here and go to a, a more direct link here. Okay. Wants that. Okay, I ended up bypassing a page here. And they want to go back. Let's do it this way. I don't know if this is the site I wanted to really go to, but let's just. This is actually uh, the, the GPO site. This is the main site, government printing office. This is one I was talking about. Anything published by the federal government, you can get at this particular site. And that certainly includes the Code of Federal Re Regulations. I've got to get uh, to a more direct link to individual chapters. And I thought this would be it, but this doesn't appear to be it at all. Let me jump back to that link, see if that, where that gets us. It might be a more direct link. Quarter of Federal Regulations, choose year. This is just a different site. I haven't been on here. Um, well, I mean, here are all the titles. And I'm going to, one thing I just want to point out is that they're updated annually, but we've got all these chapters in a do one-fourth of them every quarter, update them. New versions come out. So if you look down here, you're seeing January 1st, 2012. That means that these all, the first ones here all came out in January, the first quarter of them up to Title 15, and then or 16, whatever it is there, and then you see the next ones were updated in April 1st of last year, quarterly. And then you see July 1, and then down here, you're gonna see October 1. So just understand, they. They're updated annually, but at a per particular time, depending upon what title they are. And I would just uh, uh, pick on 29 downloads for chapter, I don't know if I want to actually, 1910, if I'm not mistaken, 1910 might be OSHA in title, 29? Yeah, whatever. Oh, I didn't bring it up as a PDF. Just slow. Yeah, that's what you get for working with Internet Explorer. Okay, you guys get the idea. We'll move on. Um, state of Wisconsin, understand the state of Wisconsin law is broken up into three areas, and that would be our constitution, our statutes, and our administrative code. And the information you want is all in the administrative code. The constitution, basically a carbon copy of the US constitution. The statutes, those are the documents that are written by your senators and your representatives to the assembly. So when they make laws, that's where they reside. They really don't have a lot of information. Typically when they're making a, a state law at that level, they're dictating to an agency uh, that they have to do something. They need some regulation in a particular area. The details have to be worked out by those state agencies. And those details end up in the administrative code and they are state law. They are binding. So please be aware that administrative codes are going to be extensive and I think I'll pop to the administrative code uh, page first here yeah we know that already 
Let's just close down this site and jump back, see if we can get it. This is the administrative code's main page, and you can get down here to probably an index, I'm assuming, administrative code index. I'm not a fan of this particular index. I think there's a better index than this. Well, that's something that was just a little bit clearer with, well. Oh, come on, let's go. Oh, we'll just, I don't want to have to page down here. Just look, you know, and go through this entire system to get to where I want to get to. There are obviously a lot of chapters. Well, here's accounting, uh, uh, and it says selected dairy products. There is going to be a, a I, I don't want to call it an acronym, but it's an initialism for the agency. Uh, this is for the Department of Egg Trade and Consumer Protection. So this whole section right here, that, uh, and this is a index, and it's not, a table of contents, and I really should go back and try to find a table of contents is what I'm trying to get to. And I don't see, let's just click on it. Here, this is what I want, okay. Here are those initialisms for the various agencies, and there are a number of them. Um, the ones that are more popular, like natural resources, okay, are going to have a lot of administrative code. The one that, for example, I work with would be uh, SPS, which is Safety and Professional Services. That's now where all of our building codes in the state reside. So I mentioned the state controls buildings. Um, just quickly for those that are thinking about building a home or uh, adding on to their home or doing any kind of work, electrical work, you want to come to this particular document and um, SPS 325, or I should say 320 through 325 right here, Uniform Dwelling Code. This is where all the regulations are for building a house in the state of Wisconsin. You can design your own home. You can go get your own permits. It's all explained in here and these are all the guidelines. It tells you how to size all your structural components, how to insulate right in this particular document. So very, very powerful uh, website, a tremendous amount of information. That is just, this is, that was just a code going down there, uh, an index of the stuff just within that particular state agency. Natural resources certainly is gonna be important. Egg trade and consumer protection, most important for uh, those people in the food and bioprocess engineering area because all your food safety regulations are here. This is where they reside. This is where our state government puts those laws. Okay, now there might be some stuff in the statutes. You can go to the state statutes and, and, and look at some of the stuff there, but it's usually duplicated in this particular document. You can see soil and water resource management programs, that sort of stuff. So I'm just trying to quickly make you aware of some of the places that you should go uh, and do, you know, some of your literature searching that you typically would probably not find on your own. I talked about handbooks and reference manuals. I really don't need much to say much more about that. Just do a library search on a good textbook sometimes to get you started. If you're in an area that you really don't understand a lot about and it's broad, you can't beat a really good textbook to pull everything together for you. And we do have some websites that are available to us as faculty, staff, and students of UW-Madison, uh, eBooks that you can download. And take this opportunity, while you're still enrolled here, to go to some of these sites and, uh, and download some of these textbooks that you know will be really handy when you get out of here because you will not have 
free access to them once you're gone. And I just put this site here. It seems that we change services every year. Uh, this has to be about the fourth one that I can think of. And I have a problem getting directly from here to the library site. But we could probably go to the library and find our way down through there. Let me back up here at this library site. I think right here, eBooks, right on kind of that main page. Uh, uh, let me go to, boy, I'm thinking that, uh, let's, let's look at a database library. Uh, the one, I think this Cyverse right here is the typically the one that you want to use as an engineer. Yeah. So it's got them category by life sciences, different areas of engineering, math, material science. And let's just click on one of those really quick here. And typically the ones that have, you can see here, if the key is in uh, green, that is something that is free, that you can typically download the whole ebook. So you can see that you know, it might be a journal or a book. Lots of great information. We'll skip back and leave that. Uh, the last, one of the last, I think this might be my last slide, is BFE reference manual when you take the fundamentals of engineering exam, which uh, I need to stress that you have to take it in order to get a grade in BSE 509. If you have not taken it by the time BSE 509 is complete. You do not get a grade, you get an incomplete. So that's something you need to do. The FE Reference Handbook is the only document that you can take into that exam. I should say you don't even take it into the exam. They give it to you when you get there. Otherwise, people would write a bunch of stuff in there that they're not supposed to write in there. So they give you a copy of it. But you can, uh, that you use for the exam, and then you actually have to leave it there. You can't take it with you because they don't want you writing stuff in the book and taking it out, like questions that were in there to share with your friends. Obviously, you can't take really any kind of cameras or anything into the exam. Reason being is that they carry over questions from year to year. They do that so that they can compare exams from year to year. They add new questions. And are those questions, were those questions hard or easy? The only way that they know is if they give the same, a part of the exam is identical for two groups. And if this group, okay, over here scores really well on the same set of questions, they say, well, this is a good group of students. But if this good group of students performs poorly on those new questions, they know, oh, those new questions are hard. And therefore, they adjust their final scoring accordingly. That's how it works, okay? So what is a 70 or above, and they, they, they adjust scoring, they adjust your score, you get a grade be, you know, between 0 and 100, and if you have a 70 or higher, you pass. Well, what's a 70 varies from year to year, okay? At any rate, get back to this. That document that you get to use is online. You can get a, a free copy of it, download it. You have to put some information in there, but then you have it. And you can go through it and get familiar with it before you take the exam. And it's something you definitely want to do. It's such a good reference document. It's really something uh, you'd benefit by having at your fingertips all the time while you're a student. Because all the tables that you've ever used, tables of uh, integrals and the differentials and things like that, they're all compiled in there. Of all those equations that you had in fluid mechanics and all those equations in thermal, they're all piled into there. It's just a book full of information. All the chemistry stuff, physics, things on electricity, Kirchhoff's laws, all those things. So just pile in that document. So here's just another good source of information. And uh, let's end it there. I know I ran a little bit longer than I wanted to today. But bottom line here, a uh, lot of great places to go look for information. Understand technical information is better than a lot of the other stuff you'll find online. The stuff you get at commercial sites is great typically for establishing some specifications, as I mentioned. Your assignments. Next Tuesday, 
you have to hand in assignment two, which is 10 annotated references. And those exclude patents and standards. The next assignment, we're going to be after 10 patents, standards, or a combination of those two. And then the third assignment on information retrieval, which will be due the week after that, is going to be on an interview, a personal interview. So definitely start working if you haven't already, and I've some uh, I've have some handed in here already. And if you want to do that, that's fine. But definitely start working on that stuff this weekend so it doesn't hit you next week. There's an example, obviously, on the homework assignment uh, that's online of what an annotated bibliography is. It's just a couple sentences that describe what's, in addition to the reference, there's a little section following it that describes what's in the document in your own words. Okay, two or three sentences. So scan it and write that up. What format that bibliography is in, that's up to you. Use whatever standard uh, convention you're happy with that you were maybe taught in uh, EPD, 155, 397, or whatever communication course you took. I'm not going to mess with it or try to change it. And, and you're going to want to follow that same convention when you write your paper. Do what you feel you want to. Are there any other questions? That just. Uh, uh, I've had those questions asked me here within the last day, so any other ones pertaining to the assignment? Okay. If you do, email me, stop by my office, there all the time.